The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. This is going to be, I think Jennifer wants to make a series <clears throat> out of this. When I was a, a young pastor and when we traveled many years later, we saw a need in the body at large. And <clears throat> uh, every three years, I like to, every three years, how would you like to say that? Every three years or so, which is probably, this is probably the 30th time in three years, <laughs> it feels like. But every three years, I like to teach on the will. Uh, my spiritual father uh, said the same thing. He said, if I had it to do over again, what would I teach? And I would say one of the least understood areas is the will. Uh, we did one message in January called Feasting on the Will. You know, that's where Jesus said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. Well, what does that mean? That's not poetic talk. There was, there was a way in which he feasted on obedience to his father. And he was the word of God. He was... Uh, the will of God incarnate, really. And <clears throat> last, uh, last week we taught on the jet stream of God's will. It's a flow. It's not just a plan, and then you have to try to do it. It's, it's a plan that you enter into like a flow, like a jet stream. We do have a book on it. And we do have a book on it, Flowing in the River of God's Will. And it's back there. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, today I wanted to do... Uh, the third part to that will, stuff that's not in the book, uh, and there's, there's plenty in the book. But this one is understanding the progression of the will of God. Uh, everybody does not start out walking in the perfect will of God. Isn't that true? And there's hit and miss. And I want to cover some of that. Uh, and, and the real key is where, where we're headed or the destination of the will of God. Uh, uh, Pastor Cliff found this verse some years ago, and we got a kick out of it, but it's actually very, very profound. In the message translation, Romans 4, verses 1 to 3, it says, So how do we fit what we know about Abraham, our first father in the faith, into this new way of looking at things? If Abraham, by what he did for God, got God to approve him, he could certainly have taken credit for it, but the story we're given is a God story, not an Abraham story. Therein lies a significant, profound truth. It's not the Abraham story. It's that Abraham entered into the God story. God has a plan for everybody's life, and you can have your own dreams and visions of what you want to accomplish, what you feel like you need, what you feel like this would make me happy and all that but it wasn't really successful and your life will not be truly successful until you enter into the God story, what God has for you. And <clears throat> it says, but the story we're given is a God story, not an Abraham story. When we read in the scriptures, Abraham entered into what God was doing for him and that was the turning point of his life. I wanna see that to be the turning point of a lot of Christians' life. Because uh, there's even a lot of courses right now that always bothered me. Uh, your dream, follow your dream, go for your dream. And I know what they're trying to do. They're trying to encourage you to fulfill destiny. But on the other hand, they almost give you the impression is that you concoct what you want and then twist God's arm to make it happen. And that's really not the way it works. And it's promotion does not come from the east or the west, but it's God who lifts up one and puts down another. Uh, if you could be the best person that you could possibly be in a situation you don't want to be in, I know Tyler's learned some of this in your jobs. When I first got saved, came off of drugs and, 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 a, and a messed up life, uh, college education, yet I took a job for, for less than welfare. And I went three times to get that job because God told me to go see. And I cleaned restrooms. And the presence of God was so strong that 
I actually could feel the joy of the Lord doing something like that. And instantly, the boss came and said, can you do this? Can you do that? Can you do that? And within a week of just being the best person I could be on a, on a really a rotten job, he said, I haven't had anybody come and ask me for a job three times. It's been 30 years, I think he said. No one's ever asked me because God kept sending me back. I was relieved every time he said no. <laughs> but go back home and God said, go back again. He said no. Go back again. The third time he hired me, next thing you know, within a week or so, I had an office job of the overflow of every... He literally created a job for me. From mopping floors and cleaning restrooms to a desk job where eventually I led that guy to the Lord. And he was a, um, he was a, <clears throat> you know, what would you call him? He would have been the supervisor in a trucking firm in the maintenance department where uh, he was kind of like the head honcho foreman. And um, in my day, you know, I had the earring and the headband. This, we're talking the 70s and 60s, you know, so he was Mr. Cool. Um, he knew my background a little bit, so he was... He couldn't stand this smiling all the time. And uh, it really bothered him. And we sat at two desks facing each other. And so he would throw drugs at me, go, you know what these are? You know what these are? And go, yeah, I know what those are. I know what those are. He, goes, he said, you want them? No. He took off his watch. He had an expensive watch. And my car had riveted holes of rust. And it wasn't likely it was going to pass inspection in Pennsylvania anyway. He took his watch and smashed it against the wall and he says what's your god doing for you your car looks like it's got cancer it's not going to pass inspection and i can i can go buy myself another watch and i had a free uh, pocket new testament you know free you're not supposed to sell them they're free <laughs> and i said oh yeah you got so much money you never bought nothing from me he goes like what I said, here, there's this Bible, unless you're afraid of it. Of course, you... I had him sized up pretty good. I knew where he was coming from. He had a little bit of an ego. Ah, here, he threw me $5 <laughs> for a free Bible. And uh, you know, who's conning who here? I don't know. <laughs> uh, but uh, anyway, it was the lesson that I learned is that promotion doesn't come from the east or the west. You want to you want to strive to get what you want and you lose. You move in a meekness toward the will of God and promotion comes. You be the best person you can be at that stinky old job and God'll do the promoting. He wants your heart more than he wants your ability. He wants your availability to him than your ability. So you can do it the hard way or the easy way. God will take you by the easiest way you're willing to go. So what would you rather do? Go around the mountain 29 times and, and do it wrong until you get worn out <laughs> or what? But the key word in understanding all of Christianity uh, for me was understanding meekness as a biblical term. You say, oh, what's meekness got to do with anything? Well, you know, uh, meekness reveals how much you're for God. A lack of meekness reveals how much you're into self. Meekness is how much you're into God. Lack of meekness is how much you're still into self. And you can evaluate yourself. But Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, Jesus says, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am meek and lowly of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. There's a rest for the people of God that very few enter into because they're so busy spending most of their Christian life striving. And so when I was looking at the will of God, that which is not in the book, you can buy our book on flowing in the river of will, God's will, because it is one of the least understood areas. Uh, when we traveled, we, we were shocked. People didn't even know how to yield or surrender because they thought their will was up here. When your will is down here by the conscience, where you go, that means it'll inform your mind, but it starts here. All right? And so 
a, a gut relationship with God is where intimacy progresses. Now, uh, <clears throat> we know that there's levels of maturity. So we're saying, how do I progress in the will of God? Um, meekness really reveals how much we've died to ourselves, if that makes it easier. Uh, but in other words, it's easy to be happy. How many are happy when things go your way? That, that's not much of a challenge. To be happy when things go your way, and to be unhappy when things don't go your way also shows a lack of meekness. The powder. You know, my mother said that was my tool when I was a kid, but it never really worked. She didn't go along with it. I put out the bottom lip every time I didn't get my way. She goes, you're going to trip over that, but I'm not doing it. Eventually, you find out pouting didn't work. It wasn't a good, strong, manipulative tool. And the only one that suffered was me. So the testing comes when there's unpleasant circumstances and unpleasant people. Now, I know no, nobody knows any unpleasant people, right? You never ran into an unpleasant person your whole life, right? There's none at work ever? Uh-uh. School? No. Unpleasant circumstances? No. No one's here ever dealt with that. But just in case you do, every moment is an opportunity to pass a test. And all temptations and all trials are tailor-made for you. So look at the repetitive trials in your life. There's something God wants to work out of your life because it's tailor-made for you. Until you get the victory over it, it's going to keep on happening. So in all your disgruntled condition, know this, that was tailor-made for you because he's trying to work on something in you. Now, <clears throat> I want to cover uh, the progression. How many know that in type, in 1 John, the progression is child, young man, and mature father, mother, and Jesus, all right? John says, I speak to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven. That's good, but that's still very immature in the will area. I speak to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven. I speak to you, young men, because the word of God abides in you strong and you've overcome the wicked one. That's, that's a little bit beyond a, a, a baby Christian. That's one who has found victory by reason of use. And lastly, as I speak to you, Father, for you've known him who was from the beginning. You've entered into a, a mature level to where you love not your life unto death. It's like the first level, Christian, is you overcome by the blood. You find out you're forgiven. And you spend most of your life striving, <laughs> unfortunately, of self-effort. If you know a Christian that's struggling, they're in self-effort. That's still the childlike stage where you're trying to do the will of God, but it's like, man, I'm messing up all the time. But later, as you mature in the will, as you progress in the will of God, you start being strong in the Lord and you overcome, and stuff that used to devastate you now is kind of just a mild irritation. That's how you can tell that inwardly you are progressing in the will of God. You're living a victorious life. You're seeing overcoming and after all, we used to say it here a lot, life is 10% circumstances, 90% attitude. Your attitude can take you down. Your attitude will determine your performance. So you have the little Christian whose their sins are forgiven and they know that the blood of Jesus forgives me so when I mess up I can get forgiveness. But the, the, they're making it so hard to live the Christian life. It's so much of it is in self-effort. They really need to graduate in their will and progress into the place of, it is no longer I who live. I have to die to that uh, independent self that wants what independent self wants. I'm going to have to die to the fact and say, God's got a plan for my life. And just because I can't figure it out doesn't mean I'm not going to relinquish myself more fully to it. I'm going to give myself. Then you enter into a Galatians 2.20 where the word of God will abide in you strong because he's manifesting as Lord of your life. And you're walking in more peace than the average Christian who is struggling in self-effort. The third element 
is first element, we overcome by the blood of the Lamb. Second element, uh, by the word of our testimony. What's the word of the testimony mean? Be like Tyler was sharing. I was like this and now I'm like this. When you see internal change, only God can bring that about. And when God brings it about, it becomes a testimony. But a testimony means you pass the test somewhere along the line. All right? And lastly, it's that you love not your life unto death. You have found the satisfaction in the will of God that is not drudgery, but it's like this is what I was missing in all those years I was trying to live the Christian life in my own strength. You know, alcoholics have a meeting. I'm an alcoholic or I'm a drug. They, they have the confession of what they are. I'm saying well, a lot of the church ought to stand up and say, I'm a selfer. I've been trying to live the Christian life in my own strength. You know, they need to repent of that because the grace of God and the empowerment of God is available to you. It's, this is Resurrection Sunday. That resurrection life will give strength to your mortal body. It'll bring life to your mortal body, but you have to yield to it. It's not going to force itself on you. Now, all right, so I want you to evaluate yourself today. This will be the third message on the will. We should put this together in a set. Uh, Jennifer wants this in a set on the will of God. But this is the progression of the will of God. And this is not covered in our book, but I, I really wanted to cover it. Like I said, every three years I like to bring this to the surface for the whosoever will apply themselves will do something with it. The I wills <clears throat> in Scripture. Uh, how many know that in Isaiah chapter 14, note takers, write it down because this will determine if you're going to progress or not. These were the I wills of Lucifer. How many know that it didn't end well? Okay. Well, there was five things. Lucifer, son of the morning. He was in love with his own self of wanting what self wanted. I want, I want, I need, I want, I need. And there were five things in his will he did. He was given a glorious position, but he wasn't satisfied. I want what I want, and I want it now. That's the voice of the flesh, in case you don't recognize that and never had that happen. But it said, oh, how you have fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, how you've been cut down to the ground, you who have weakened the nations. For you have said in your heart, and here's where he set in his heart. He was high ranking angel, but in love with himself and in love with what self wanted. And there's five I wills that are a caution. If this brought Lucifer down, it'll bring you down. The first one is, I will ascend into heaven. And he said this with great latitude. I will ascend into heaven. Exaggeration. Have you ever exaggerated about your own ability? or your own wants and desires. Exaggeration is really, he was called later the father of lies. It's still a lie. To exaggerate is to add to, to inflate, to say with great latitude, to express yourself, to make you look better, you exaggerate. It's all about self. So the first I will that you want to deal with is exaggeration. I will ascend into heaven. And here's the other one. The second I will is I will exalt my throne above the stars. Uncontrolled ambition. Now, if you want to have an ambition and you want to compete, then compete for the prize of the upward call in Christ Jesus. But to compete and want what other people have, to have an ambition that is out of control, that I want, I need, because I will not be satisfied unless this ambition that's running wild in me is fulfilled. And the funny thing is you'll have a tendency to walk over people to get it. 
People do that in the corporate ladder, do they not? It's not who you climb over to get what you want. And that brings us into the third I will. I will also sit on the mountain of the congregation on the father's sites of the north. I will dominate. And here's an interesting thing, that domination. <clears throat> God created you to have authority over every creeping thing, over the fish of the sea, over the not over people. He did not create you to dominate people. And there are people whose will, some call them headstrong, some call them willful, some call them controllers, some call them Jezebels, but in reality, they want to dominate. They want to rule. They cannot have successful interpersonal relationships because they have to be on top. And in business, they're always jockeying for position. You know anybody like that? If you've been like that, that area of your will will need to be sanctified and set apart for God's use because it brings to, it brings to naught anything that's of value. Remember, this is Lucifer's I wills. These are the I wills that got him in trouble. Is there something wrong with competition? There's healthy competition, but compete to be the best person you can be in the sight of God, not compete with another person or individual. You were born an original. Why would you want to be a copy of somebody else anyway? That's just showing there's a lack of identity and you're searching for your identity in your job. If titles... But that's what he wanted them. And that's the next I will. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I'm going to have a position. There are people that have lived this way to such a degree that after they're old and they retire, they're almost suicidal because they don't know what to do because their whole identity was based on a position. It was based on a title. Some of these gated communities you see, former CEOs, it's like... It's almost amusing if it wasn't sad. But they're so used to being the boss that now that they're retired, they're sticking their nose in the neighbor's yard to see what he's doing and if he couldn't do it better. <laughs> really, it's like I'm so used to this place of position. And, and what was the verse we started this with? There is a key in Jesus the most anointed person that ever walked the face of the earth. And he said, I am meek and lowly. And this is where you'll find rest for your souls. I don't believe some of these people who have succeeded great things have rest. Some of the people that have gotten the highest positions are jumping off of some of the highest buildings. So it's not all about position. And the last one, the fifth one, the I wills of Lucifer. And all of this is in Isaiah 14. Verses uh, 12, to, well, 12 to 19, you can see the whole story of Lucifer. But there's something in the will, the free will that God gave that you need to understand if you're ever going to make progress in this life. If you're ever going to find the kind of satisfaction and enter into the spiritual rest, regardless of people and consequences. That's success in life. Success in life is when you're not being controlled by people and circumstances. You're being controlled by, you're, somebody's going to control you. There's no neutral. In World War II, they used to use Switzerland as an example of neutral. They didn't get involved. In the kingdom of God, in the, in, in, in the spiritual realm, there's no neutral. You either serve God or you serve, your, you know, yourself and Satan. There's no middle road. You're going to serve somebody, make the choice how you're going to live your life. And if God had a plan for you and it's written before you were born... Trust me, you might not think that you would like it. You might think you have a better idea. Lucifer thought he had a better idea. He thought he had a better plan than what God had positioned him. And God actually, you know, he was, uh, when he fell, he took one-third of the angels with him. That rebellion. That's what the will will do. It'll cause trouble. It'll cause despair. And listen to this, I will ascend, I will exalt, I will sit, I will ascend, I will be like the most high. I will be like the most high God. I'm going to, and this is really what the will does, I will imitate God. When you walk in your own willfulness, you are playing God. You are saying, I will be like God. I will do it my way. Frank Sinatra did a song like that, right? I did it my way. Regrets, I have a few. I'll bet he's got a few more right now. Huh? 
because the consequence is, and listen to what God says. Lucifer said, I will exalt, I will ascend, I will sit, I will ascend and be like the heights of the cloud. I have position. I'll, I'm going to imitate God. I'm going to be just like the Most High God. I'm going to be like Him. I want His job. Oh, okay. So you get His job. You do it your way. Huh? What's it say? Well, the Scripture says you shall be brought down to the lowest parts of the... You'll be eliminated. Oh, there's my reward for doing it my way. I'm eliminated. <laughs> God had five responses to those five wills. You want to hear what God said about Lucifer's choices of independence? You will be thrown into hell. You'll be made a spectacle. You're going to be mocked and scorned. You're going to be cast out like a carcass. And you'll be alone. And I don't think people really know what alone means without the presence of God. I mean, even if you're an unsafe person on planet Earth, there's enough Holy Spirit on this planet right now that you don't know the terrors of alone. You don't know what alone would really be like. You don't want to do it your way. Okay? So, really, a child Christian, your sins are forgiven, but you could spend most of your life in self-effort dealing with these things thinking, well, I'm a Christian, but I need to be the head of the company. I'm a Christian, but I've got ambition, and I'm going to walk over Susie if it takes everything in me. She's standing in the, my way. She works with me, but she doesn't respect me. I'm going to deal with that. I'm going to find a way around that. And, I mean, you can play all kinds of games. When I was in the factory working with... Uh, welders and fitters and, and machine operators, uh, they were coarse, worldly people can be coarse in their language. But then I got promoted into time study. I was a, uh, what they called a, a uh, time study. You walk around with a clock and you time people's jobs, which makes you not very popular, uh, especially if you had worked on the floor and you know those jobs. You know how people cheat to find, make an easy way of working that they weren't afraid of the time study guys that came out of college they were afraid of me because I was a time study guy that had actually done those jobs the guys come out of college uh, to heat the steel they could turn the furnace on low be like on your stove put it at a low temperature uh, it takes uh, takes an hour and a half to get this furnace heated up when anyone that's worked that job knows 10 minutes they're trying to get a rate for their production to make life as easy as possible on themselves, not to see how much they can produce. Then if they get a good rate, they can get paid for 12 hours on an eight-hour day. That's a good deal. That's incentive. But if you get it illegally to where you could do that job in four hours and you're getting paid for 12, you're cheating the company. Well, see, time study goes in and finds those little discrepancies and gets rid of them. Well, I saw that in that, some people worked harder at not working than if they would have actually done their job and honored God. I saw guys, now this is a tank car manufacturing, a railroad tank cars. You've probably seen the things that look like hot dogs on the railroad track. Well, we, we assemble those. And they would go on rollers, and they would weld, and they would spin on a circle, and the welder would weld them. And, and you could see underneath, a couple feet underneath them, because they were on rolls. And I would see guys, I'm surprised they didn't have crooked backs, all day long looking, because see, we had steel-toed shoes, but the foreman wore dress shoes. So they would spend most of the day looking for the foreman's feet because if they see the foreman's feet, they actually start working. They, they made it more difficult <laughs> to avoid work than to actually do their job. Hmm?
the second element. All right, let's say, let's say I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with self-effort, but I'm going to deal with all of these five I wills of Lucifer and the flesh and the devil, and I'm not going to, I'm going to progress. I'm going to move to the next level. You want to see the next level? This is the level of the strong young man who's strong in the word, overcome the wicked one. Are you that person? Are you strong in the Lord and overcome the wicked one? Or are you still wrestling in self-effort, trying to live the Christian life in your own strength? We'll have a, a special meeting for you called the Selfers Prayer. I admit, matter of fact, some of you ought to pray it right now. Some of you are watching by Ustream. I am repent, Lord, on this Easter Sunday that I'm a selfer. I've been trying to live the Christian life in my own strength, and it's really been hard, and I'm not happy, which is a sign that you're trying to live the Christian life in your own strength, because blessedness, happy, uh, makarios, a life joy that is enviable is found in obedience to God. If you don't have that, you're still in self-will. Life joy is a makarios in the Greek, which means a life joy that is enviable regardless of people or circumstances. Uh, that means someone that's happy regardless of what's going on and regardless of all the crazy relatives and all the crazy people at work. In spite of all that, I'm enjoying life. Don't you want that? Well, here it is. The prophetic... We called it the prophetic stance, and it's found in Micah. Write this down. Micah chapter 7, verses 7 through 9. There's the I wills of the more mature saint who's not all hung up on self. Micah 7, verses 7 to 9. Here's the I wills. Now, this is the prophet, but this is the sign of the way a mature person should be approaching life. I don't know what's going on in my life. I don't know what God has for me. I don't know what's going on with those people at work. I don't know what's going on with those people at school. I don't know what's going on in my family. I don't know but this and everybody's not complying to my wishes and my will. <laughs> I will, number one, I will look to the Lord. <laughs> Get your eyes off of people and circumstances and look to God. Focus. Put your eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of your faith. The fixed gaze of anticipation going like, oh, life's crazy at work. Life's crazy in my family. I think they're all losing their mind, but you know what? I'm going to look to the Lord with anticipation. God is big enough. He can do something about that. I don't know what, because I don't have to know all the answers. All I have to do is have this fixed gaze of anticipation that God is able his word is able, and he made me able. Somehow, if I surrender to him, all of that's going to start working. It doesn't mean that they will work because they could be trying to live the rest of their life in self-effort, and you can't make somebody do anything. Really, you can't make anyone do anything. And I had parents used to tell me, Oh, yes, I can. I can make that son and daughter of mine do what I want them to do. Good luck, because as soon as they're not in your proximity, they're going to do what they want to do. Rebellion is in the heart. It's not something you can legislate. You can't legislate control. And you can't control someone who's under control. So here's a person that's under control in a very difficult time. And the first thing is, I will look to the Lord. I'm going to have a fixed gaze of anticipation. The second, I will. And you can find this all in uh, Micah 7, 7 through 9. The second, I will, is I will wait for God. I'm going to drop down, sink into that relationship. I'm going to stay open until love comes through. No matter what happens, I am not going to take matters into my own hands. I'm going to say, open to God, open to life, open to whatever God has for me, but I am not going to take matters into my own hands. That's self-will. That's the Lucifer's plan. I will ascend. I will control. I will. 
succeed. No, this is I will wait. I will surrender. I will yield. That's the way you live by dying and you fight by yielding. I will wait for God. The third I will. Oh, I've messed up. I'm not perfect. But when I fall, I will get up. Some people stay down for the count and groan and moan and complain for days and weeks at a time. I'll tell you what, some even longer than that. Some make it a permanent habitation. But yes, I failed, but I will get up. Don't rejoice over me, my enemy, because when I fall down, I get back up. That's what it says in Micah. That's a will that is surrendered to God. It's not perfect person. It's someone who no, responds instantly. You know, when I wrestled in high school, they taught, it, it was like after a while, you have this memory, uh, muscle memory, that the minute, if you were to roll over on your back, you turn over like a cat. And it's, it, it's almost impulsive. You don't go on your shoulder. You don't get pinned. You don't stay down. You learn to spontaneously get back uh, in an upright position or in all fours, but not on your back. When I fall down, and you know, failing is not fatal unless you stay there. No matter how many times you trip them up, loyal people don't stay down long. They're out on their feet. Now the wicked end up on their face for good. Think of it. Though a righteous man falls seven times, he gets back up. This was the illustration I saw when I was a young Christian. Someone held their hand up and they said, the righteous fall down, boom. They receive forgiveness and they get back up. The righteous falls down again and gets back up. When the wicked are down, they're down permanently. Though the righteous falls seven times, he gets back up. All right. But here's the other thing that I learned. And much of what's written in our books came out of this experiential knowledge with Jesus. And you know what? Most of the things that we learn that really ministers to people, we learn because we did it wrong. I did it wrong. Jennifer did it wrong. When you fall down, learn from it. Don't just get up and do it again. <laughs> what good is that? If you failed, you've learned a key secret. If you get back up, you learn, I don't want to do that again. And here's what led to that position. And you, you accumulate a kind, of, uh, a kind of wisdom that accumulates over the years. It can sound very profound to someone that's never fallen into it. But you take someone that's failed, got back up, and learned from it, and you'll see a successful person in the kingdom of God. So I will look to the Lord is the number one focus of a, a more mature saint. I will look to the Lord. I will wait. I will stay open, and I'm not going to shut down until God comes through. Love never fails. Love's going to come through. I just don't have all of the facts. So when I don't have all the facts, I'm not going to make some. You know, that's what people do. When people don't have enough facts, they fill it in with a guess. I've seen more relationships ruined by people filling in the blanks of stuff they don't know. Reading motives into other people when you really don't know. You're not that discerning to know their motive. But what do people do when you don't have an answer? You fill it in with a judgment. You can call it an opinion, but nevertheless, you don't really know. I'm going to learn from it. When I sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light to me, even in my darkness times. You know, uh, I, I'm going to learn to accept the unknown, the unattainable, the uncontrollable. I'm going to sit and wait upon God, and I'm going to learn from it as to how he would have me behave. Because you're not going to know everything. You can't attain everything you think of, and you can't control everything you want to control. So at some point, you need to reckon with God that I'm going to let him be in control. He'll show me what I need to know, and anything that's worth attaining, it'll be by him who 
causes promotion to come, not from the east or the west, but it's God who lifts up one and puts down another. That's a safer place to be. So I will look to the Lord. I will wait for God. Stay open. I will arise when I fall down. I'll get up right away too. And the quicker you get up, the quicker you respond to forgiveness, the better. When you forgive quickly, you actually build a spiritual muscle on the inside that teaches you eventually to not even have to forgive because you'll be tempted and you go, I ain't going there. I'm not going there. But the person that wallows, that takes weeks and months on any topic, that self is getting fortified. I'm seeing all kinds of crazy. I, I should never look for uh, theology on Facebook because it drives me nuts. I want to answer people. But there's weird stuff out there. Of course, you know if it's on Facebook, it's got to be true, right? But there's stuff like, oh, if you've been hurt or wounded, you just need to shout it out, yell it out, go through the full gamut of emotions and express yourself. That's nonsense. You're fortifying it. You're angry, so you punch a pillow. You're just going to be an angrier person who's developed that anger. Anyone that takes more than minutes to work something out is still a child in some Christian aspect. If you can't deal with something in a moment, there's something in you that wants to be king self. It wants to be general manager of the universe, and it wants to imitate God and be a God unto yourself. Think about that. That's, that's a serious consequence. But anybody that... See, like, I used to have my temper tantrum with God, and I thought there was a purpose to it. That in my temper tantrum, I was telling God, in case he didn't know, how upset I was. And if I didn't show him upset, then he might think that I didn't really care one way or another. But what God really brought to my attention as a young Christian was that temper tantrum. You're fortifying and you're opening the door to demonic activity that's going to make you even stronger in your fortification of your discontent and your rebellion. You're going to fortify your rebellion. You're going to strengthen it. You're going to shake your fist at God like that's going to accomplish something. Hmm? I will look to the Lord. I will wait for God because love will come through. I will arise. I'm not going to, falling is not fatal. I will get back up. I'm going to learn from it. Does this sound a little bit more like a mature Christian than the I wills of Satan? The I wills of Satan, it's all about them. <laughs> I will face my pain. You know, we've given this advice to many people. They think that their current situation is painful. They think and this is extremely deceptive. If I just run from my pain, I'll be free. No. In this world, if you don't deal with it in God, you're going to face your pain one way, or you're going to face it another way. It's pain if you do one thing, it's pain. If, it's, in other words, if someone offends you, it's pain if you don't deal with it. And if you retaliate, it's going to be pain in the retaliation. That's not a win-win scenario. But you face your pain and resolve it. Only God can take your pain and your sorrow. Forgiveness and repentance does not remove the history of the event. It does not erase the memory of it. It erases the pain and the torture that was attached to it. The only place anything gets erased is in your spirit through repentance and forgiveness. It gets erased in here where it matters. And you'll still have a memory of it, but there's no ugly feeling when you think about it. That's when you know there's been a supernatural transaction that's taken place. The next I will, I will hope. The Lord will bring me forth to the light. There's a good end coming. There'll be light at the end of my dark tunnel. Love never fails. Hope is staying open. At the end of that tunnel, God's going to come through. 
Don't ask me how because I don't know how to attain it. I don't understand how to know it and I can't control it. I'm going to trust God and light will come. Love never fails. It's a question, will you stay open and wait for... That's hope. Hope is the anchor that goes behind the veil that in the midst of your darkness, you're still attached and the God of hope will bring it to pass. And the last I will is I will see God's deliverance. I will see redemption. How can someone in a difficult situation, a hopeless, despairing situation, how can they say, I'm going to see deliverance and redemption? Because God has the final word, and redemption is the name of the game. Your plan is to circumvent redemption and satisfy flesh. God never changes the total in its entirety. Kingdom is redemption. Redemption is the name of the game. It doesn't ever change. What God wants to do is redeem you and deliver you from the control of the world, the flesh, and the devil. So redemption will come. I will look to the Lord. I'm going to read you all seven of them in Micah 7, 7 to 9. And this is the sign of a mature saint who is not just struggling in their self-life, taking forever to deal with stuff days and weeks. It's an insult to even take days to deal with an issue. That's an insult. That says that you are king self, that you want to be general manager. You want to exalt your throne. You want to exaggerate the problem. You know, if you don't deal with something, you will make a mountain out of a molehill. You have the mental capacity to make something big and something little. A real Christian is 90% attitude, 10% circumstances. But you can very easily be switch that around and make life 90% circumstances. Oh, you don't know what I've been through. You don't know. Well, tell that to Jesus that he doesn't know what you went through. People like to say that to other people. But I'm going to see deliverance. I'm going to see the redemption. All right. That's not the best part. Are you ready for the last one? This is mature mothers and fathers. This is actually a level of living and abiding that you've so offered your body a living sacrifice, sacrifice unto God, that you've learned by reason of use, by reason of use, you've learned to surrender radically regularly radically regularly surrender you've learned to fight by yielding and surrendering all right here's the promise of the father and i've often used this in in explaining it because it always stuck in my mind that in john chapter 12 Verses 9 and 10, um, it talks about the resurrection of Lazarus. It said, now, a great many of the Jews knew that he, Jesus was there and that they came for Jesus' sake only, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. The chief priests plotted to put Lazarus to death. Also, because of him, many believed. Because Lazarus was raised to the dead, many people believed. That was a threat to the kingdom of darkness, wasn't it? Resurrection is a threat. Anyone who has allowed life to flow where there was death is a witness and a testimony. They love not their life unto death is the third level. First level is your sins are forgiven through the blood. Second level of the I wills is the word of your testimony. The third level is love not your life. That's child, young man, father. Three clear levels of the cross. Now, at that third level, because of Lazarus, and I always said, become a because. And you know what? Uh, Vicky's got a lot of testimonies from around the world that have come in 
that have found some of our material and have used it and have radically changed their life. So we became a because. That should be your testimony too. And many of you here are. There are many people who have a changed life because of your witness, your testimony, your life. You become a living epistle. In other words, you, they're reading your life. They're not just reading what you're saying or what you're doing. They're saying, whatever it is you're doing, it's working. I need that. I need what works. I don't know about you, but I don't need any dead-end trails. If it doesn't work, I'm not really that interested. I'm not even concerned in some areas of theology where it's really I don't see the redemption in it. So someday we'll find out. Some people get into that. Okay, fine, but I want to see changed lives, and I want to see it in a place to where I can demonstrate it, not just speak it, live it, be a living epistle, so that what that can proclaim to other people. Because of Lazarus, many people believed. Because he became a because. And God wants you to become a because. Now listen to this, Psalm 91. These are the last I wills. But what's beautiful about this is the purpose, the person or persons who are submitting to the will of God have positioned themselves for God the Father to say His I wills. Psalm 91, particularly verse 14. This is the word of the Lord. Because He has set His love upon me, therefore I will deliver Him. That's the Father's I will. This does, you can claim these things, but if you're living in self-effort, then that's not going to work. I'm sorry. This is for a because. I see people pick scriptures out, like out of the promise box, and claim them. No, you need to, there's certain things that God says, before you get that, you do this. You do this, you get that. The audacity of God to have requirements on his blessings and his promises. I thought they were all free. Well, they're free, but you position yourself to receive them. He said, become a because. God's because. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place. Dwelling means abide, you stay there. Because you have set your love upon me. It's not grudging attitude. God, why did you give me this? Or why, why aren't you doing what I want you to do? Because you have set your love upon me. Because you have known my name. And when it says you've known his name, name and nature are synonymous in Scripture. Because you've known me intimately, you know me heart to heart, breath to breath, spirit to spirit. Because you have known my nature. Because you have known my name. Verses 14 through 16 in Psalm 91. This is the blessing, and I want to pray this over everyone that's watching, everyone in the congregation, everyone that will ever see this message. This is the blessing of the Father, but you need to position yourself for it. You can't just get it and then live life whatever way you want to. You can't live by the other I wills and then expect to receive this. But there is going to be a generation, a remnant, who's going to rise up that's going to be so completely satisfied in the will of God that he's going to be able to say this to them and bless them and they're going to be able to receive it. I'm going to set you on high. I'm going to answer you. I'm going to be with you. I will deliver you and honor you. And I will satisfy you with life. That's the I wills of the Father for the person who's positioned properly. Isn't it interesting? As far as self-effort, the I wills of Lucifer tried to get those I wills in his own strength. I will exalt my throne. God says, I will set you on high. You want God to do it? Or you want to do it? It's God who lifts up one and puts down another. You want to lift yourself up? You want to exalt your throne? You want to be like the Most High God? You want to be God in your own life? See how that works for you. Is that the way they taught you reality therapy, Jennifer? 
as a psychologist. <laughs> Reality therapy is what is it you really want? And is what you're currently doing, is it working? How's that working for you? I think even, uh, what's his name? Dr. Phil used to say that. So how's that working for you? Banging your head against the wall. Is it making you any smarter? Is it accomplishing anything? I will ascend my throne, but God says, I, I want to set you on high. I want to answer you. I will be with you. And I'll never leave you or forsake you. I'm going to deliver you and honor you. I will satisfy you with long life. That's a satisfied, it's not how many years, it's the condition of enjoying the satisfaction of God's life. I, I, one of my favorite scriptures is because of this understanding meekness. If we don't understand meekness or humility, uh, none of this really works because it all becomes intellectual. If it's going to be spiritual, it's take my yoke and learn from me for I am meek and lowly of heart. And here's something, all that the world is running after, and I'm going to close with this one verse of Scripture. I can't remember where it's at. It's in the Bible. By humility and the fear of the Lord comes riches, honor, and life. How does it come? It comes from God by riches, honor, and life. Can you exert yourself like Lucifer and get it for yourself? Sure you can but it's not going to necessarily be a satisfying life. It's not necessarily going to be the honor that comes from God. What did Jesus say? I don't receive honor from men. You want to get it God's way? Proverbs 22.4. <laughs> 22, By humility and the fear of the Lord come riches, honor, and life. I don't know about you, but I want to be positioned for God to say, because you have set your love upon me and you made me your dwelling place, because you've known my nature intimately, I'm going to set you on high. I will answer you. I'll be with you. I will deliver you and honor you, and I will satisfy you with long life. And you know what? He can teach you this lesson the easy way or the hard way. For me, it was cleaning toilets, mopping restrooms. And God showed me that he promoted me in that situation within one week. I had an office job. And within a few weeks after I led the, to the Lord, the foreman, my old job called up. They said the union... Uh, at the factory cannot find anyone to run that machine that you used to run. Would you please come back to work? The union went looking for me and I was able to get out of debt. I was able to prosper. But promotion doesn't come from the east or west. It's God who lifts up one. But he's looking for a witness. He's looking for a because. He's not looking for your rebellion, your frustration, your disappointment. Your dis Matter of fact, if it begins with a dis, it's from hell. Discourage. Disappointment dissatisfied, discomfort. It's all apart from God, and it's all coming from hell. If you're engaged in any of those things, you're not submitted to God. You need to look to Him. I keep saying we're going to close, but let's look back to the pattern of the prophetic stance of a, of a maturing individual. And what does it say? I'm going to look to the Lord. I'm going to focus on Him. I'm going, to, I'm going to drop down, sink into Him, and I'm not going to take matters into my own hands. If I mess up, I'm going to get up right away real quick. I'm going to learn from it. I'm going to face my pain. I'm not going to run from pain. People get in the self-interest, run from pain. But I'm sorry, it doesn't go, you don't go anywhere. You only increase the, the consequence of it. I'm going to face my pain. I'm going to stay open till God comes through because He is a redemptive God. And I thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. 
For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit forgive123.com.